Welcome to Numerical Methods. And today I have maybe a somewhat nice excursion, excursus, uh, where we can use our numerical methods to really gain a deeper understanding on some model properties. So the topic I would like to discuss is local volatility, stochastic volatility, and implied volatility, especially how the stochastic volatility can create the implied volatility smile. And we will make use of, of our whole framework of our Monte Carlo simulation. And yeah, hopefully, I believe at the end of this session, uh, you really have a much deeper understanding of what is going on in this uh, model and why do we see certain effects? Um, let me maybe start with a teaser. So I will explain all these um, words, yeah, local volatility, implied volatility, and it's important to distinguish them. But maybe you already know implied volatility is if you have a Black Schultz model, you can also define it for other model. How should you choose the parameter sigma to match a price that is observed? And if you ask this question for European options with different strike, you get a volatility parameter for each of these options for each strike. And if these options are generated by a Black Scholes model, then of course you always get the same parameter, namely the parameter of that one model. So if you make this little program, you calculate the value of an option for a given strike using the Black Schultz formula, so using the Black Schultz model, and then you calculate for that given strike from that given value the volatility parameter that corresponds to this, you just get a flat line. Because every option with every strike has the same parameter, the parameter we used from the beginning, the 0 0.3. However, the world is not Black Scholes. So if you do this for option prices you observe for different strikes on the market, you will not get the horizontal line. You will get something different. And also, if you generate the values by a different model, you will get a different shape. For example, I have here an example where I create a Heston model. So you see here is the Euler scheme for a Heston model. And now I calculate this implied volatility curve with this Heston model. So let us first calculate it again with the Black Scholes. So we see the horizontal line. And now let's calculate it with the Heston model. And you see this little curved line. Okay, so here I have the strike on the axis. Uh, you can also print it against the logarithm of the strike, which then makes this curve here a little bit more symmetric. So actually it is quite symmetric with respect to the logarithm of the strike. And you see there's some bending going on. So if we change the model, there's some bending going on. And what I would like to do with you in this session is really understand why the model will create this bending. So what is behind this? So why is it, is it going down here and up here? And to understand this, we have to discuss some concepts and we will look at some quantities like the density, the quadratic variation, and all these concepts are quite helpful when you would like to understand such a model. So let's start by reviewing these definitions, these uh, concepts. So the implied Black Scholes volatility is given as follows. Assume I have some value, some 
could be a market price that I observe. So some value of a financial derivative on a stock S. So my stock S is here. The stock S should follow a Black Schultz model. So if I assume that it follows a Black Schultz model and the model quantities S zero, so the initial value and the interest rate are already given, then the only degree of freedom is the parameter sigma in my model. So then if it exists, I call the parameter sigma for which this model reproduces, if I value the option with this model, the observed price, so reproduces here the observed price V. This I call the implied, yeah, implied by the observed price, implied volatility. So actually you, you could define the implied volatility for different kinds of financial derivatives, but usually we will maybe look at European options, but you could also ask, okay, what is the parameter I have to choose to calculate, to reproduce the value that I observe for that given financial product. So, hence what we do is we are inverting this function model parameters are feeded into our numerical method or our analytic formula and give us the price or the value, we are inverting this function. So we ask, okay, given some value, what is the model parameter that reproduces this value? So the concept is here obtained by inverting the valuation and in case of the Black-Schultz formula, uh, in case of the Black-Schultz model, I have a formula. This is inversion of the Black-Schultz formula. So this uh, definition, of course, generalizes also if the Black-Schultz model is a bit more general. For example, you have a different discount rate. Yeah, So this interest rate here deviates from the interest rate that is used in the numeraire, or if, for example, there is also here in this part a dividend rate. Yeah, so you can you can just uh, generalize this. So the definition naturally generalizes two more general versions of the model. Yeah, we keep all the other parameters fixed and ask ourselves what is the volatility parameter we should use. And also this concept of implied volatility can be defined for a Bachelier model. So the implied Bachelier volatility, okay, is then obtained by making the assumption that the stock S follows a Bachelier model. So you see the parameter is now sigma, sigma superscript N, yeah, maybe for normal, yeah, and previously it was sigma superscript L for log normal, sigma superscript N DW yeah, instead of the previously sigma superscript L SDW. Yeah, and I can just again ask the same question. What is the parameter sigma I have to use in this model to just reproduce the observed price? And this parameter is then called the by V implied yeah, volatility. Then implied Bachelier volatility. And of course, the concept can even further be generalized yeah, to any parameter, an implied parameter yeah, is, it, is the parameter that is implied by your observable, by what you have observed in the sense that how do you have to choose this parameter to fit what you observe? Okay, so why, why do we have this implied volatility? So, um, it's nice to convert prices to implied volatility. If, um, for example, the volatility parameter is comparably constant compared to the other parameters. So of course, the price or the value, you know, so price is something that is observed on the market. Value is something we calculate with our valuation model. So of, of course the value depends on 
many parameters. It depends on the initial value, it depends on the interest rate, and it also depends on the, the volatility. And maybe the dependency on the initial value is also very strong. And if the stock moves, yeah, it's maybe that the initial value of this stock moves very strongly, and the value of this financial derivative depends very strongly on this parameter. But maybe the volatility stays comparably constant over a certain time period. Or for example, if you have options with different strikes, like in my small introduction to small teaser, then maybe if you know one parameter for one financial product, it is suitable also to value the other one. So um, the sigma is maybe a more stable way to express the value of the financial derivative yeah, if we know all the other values, which make the value of the financial derivative a little bit more volatile. So actually this concept of an implied volatility is just another form of expressing the value. Yeah? It's just a conversion of expressing the value. And that's also how it is used in industry. Yeah? You can call a trader and maybe he will tell you what is the implied volatility of the option. Yeah? So that's maybe a nicer way to communicate because then you can plug in your own values for S0 and R and, and, and get some indication where the price should be. Okay, usually when these quantities are communicated, you agree on the model that is used to calculate the implied parameter. And of course, you also have some understanding of what are the other parameters. So that's now the concept of an implied model parameter. So how do we have to choose a model parameter to match an observed value? And two prominent examples are the implied Black-Scholes volatility or the implied Bachelier volatility. So I can calculate this implied volatility for different financial products. And if I now consider, say, European options, and these European options, so European option is something that pays maximum of the stock value at some maturity capital T minus K and zero. Yeah? So this is paid in time capital T. So I can now observe European options with different strikes. So there's here the strike parameter K and I can observe these European option with different strikes. So the value will of course depend on the product parameter strike. Okay, these are the different values I observe. So since it's maximum of S minus K and zero, if I make K larger, I get less payout. Yeah? So if I make K larger, the um, value should decline. Okay. Um, so now I can calculate the implied volatility for these different European options that have different strikes, which means that I get an implied volatility, say for example, if it is a Black-Scholes volatility that depends on this strike of the European option, given that all the other model parameters yeah, are fixed. So if these prices, if the observed prices were consistent with the model, yeah, what does this mean? It means that there is a single model. There's only one model that reproduces all these prices for all the product parameters. So for all the different strikes, K, Ki, so then this means there's a single parameter sigma that reproduces all these prices. So this means that the implied volatility parameter I calculate here for these different financial products is always the same. I get this 
horizontal line. Uh, so we would observe that this map K maps to sigma L is constant. Yeah, just what I did in this little experiment. But usually what you observe on the financial market is that if you calculate the implied black scholes volatility for different strikes, you get always a different implied volatility. So this map is not constant. Yeah, the reason is the world is not black scholes. And often you observe that this curve has some convex shape. So there's some convex shape and this is called sometimes a smile, yeah? So concave would be a frown. And for that reason, this thing is sometimes called the volatility smile. The volatility smile is, if it is Black Scholes implied volatility, how much do we deviate? How much does the observation deviate from a Black Scholes model? So this discussion here was for a fixed uh, parameter T, yeah, so I just have a fixed maturity in time, but I could look at different times. If you look at different times, then actually you get a whole surface sigma as a function of capital T, the maturity at which you look, and K, the strike at which you are looking. So this is called the implied volatility surface. Okay, so let's do this small little experiment. And now instead of doing the trivial stuff that I use a Black Schultz model to calculate the values and then use Black Schultz formula to invert the values to volatility to get this horizontal line, I do the round trip that I start with the Bachelier model. I calculate values with the Bachelier model. And then I invert using the Black Schultz model. Okay, so this is the code that I have already used in the beginning. But in the beginning, I calculated the value using the Black Schultz formula. And I calculated the implied volatility by inverting the Black Schultz formula. And now let's try actually that we calculate the value using the Bachelier formula. Okay, so maybe we step through the code. <clears throat> I defined some model parameters, initial value as zero, R interest rate, yeah, in this case zero, because it doesn't matter for this experiment. Uh, volatility 30%, option maturity, my capital T, five years. Okay, and then the formula here needs the forward. Yeah? So the forward is um, S divided by the numeraire. Yeah? So it's S times E to the RT. Yeah? So I need to calculate the forward. It's the initial value times E to the RT. Yeah? So that is what this formula needs here. And then the formula needs the volatility, the option maturity, the option strike, and the payoff unit is the discount factor. It's the ratio of the numerators E to the minus RT. Okay, so that's the valuation formula. You can look in this formula. It's the Bachelier formula. Okay, so just the Bachelier formula. Yeah, if you like, you can always stick a little bit here. And then there is the inversion. Yeah, so inversion is actually a numerical root finder, but inside using the Black Schultz formula. Let's run this little program. Okay, and you will see that we have this shape. Yeah? So at the strike of one, actually I get something which looks like the input volatility. Yeah? So at the forward or the initial value in this case, because interest rate is zero, I get my input volatility. But the implied Black Scholes volatility is going down if the strike becomes larger and it's going up if the strike becomes smaller. Okay, so can we understand this? Yeah, maybe we have an understanding for this because our model 
is a DS is, okay, I do not have a DT, yeah? So there is a sigma, okay, sigma N DW. But I'm looking for the Black Scholes model implied volatility. Yeah. So, and the Black Schultz model has here a sigma L S DW. So somehow I was using this, but I'm calculating the parameter sigma L that is assuming that. So this means that the sigma L I'm looking here is maybe somewhat related. Okay, this, this relation is not really true because I'm looking at the integral. Uh, so the, the final value S of capital T, but if you have this heuristic here, it looks a little bit as if the Sigma L corresponds a little bit to, so Sigma L times S corresponds to Sigma N. So that means I have a Sigma superscript N divided by the S, yeah, because the sigma L times S is what I observe in place of the sigma N yeah, and vice versa. So this means that in regions where the stock is becoming small, the volatility that is associated with the Black Scholz model looks looks higher. No? It is like a one divided by S. And that's a little bit the shape we observe here. Okay. So if I create values with the Bachelier model, no? the distribution is modified no? in a way that would correspond to having a black Schultz model, but where the volatility is actually becoming larger for smaller values of the stock. Okay, so you see that uh, we can determine if the model is different from the Black Scholz model by looking at the implied Black Scholz volatility. And yeah, maybe we also can determine a little bit this behavior here. How does this volatility depend on the stock. And that's maybe the next concept. So we had two different models. There was the Bachelier model. So there is the Sigma DW and we had the Black Scholz model. So there is the Sigma S DW. Yeah, if you view this here as some kind of function, this is just a cons constant. This is just a linear function in S. So maybe I can generalize this part here to be just any function of S. And such a model is called a local volatility model because now the volatility depends locally on the value of the stock. Okay, so we generalize our models to local volatility models. So I introduce a function, okay, and maybe there should be a subscript lock here uh, to just make it a little bit easier to distinguish this. I introduce a function, sigma of T and S, and this function is now the coefficient in front of the diffusion, yeah, my diffusion coefficient. It is the coefficient in front of the dW. So this is my integrand of the stochastic integral. Okay, and you see that the Bachelier model is a special case where this function is constant. And the Black Schultz model is a special case where this function is just a constant times S. So this map is called the local 
volatility. And now I have a very general E2 stochastic process where my two other models are just uh, special cases. It is important to now distinguish the local volatility from the implied volatility. Now they are, well, there is a relation, but they are really different. The local volatility is describing a local behavior. So I'm locally at the time little t and the stock has a certain value. So if you like, you can maybe plot your stochastic process here. Okay, the stochastic process here, which depends maybe on time and generates different values of S. Okay, and then locally, so depending on at which time you are and at which value S you are, you use for the next infinitesimal time step, a certain volatility parameter. We already had such a nice example when we discussed the Euler scheme. Yeah? And I showed you how the Euler scheme is using the parameter sigma, that yeah, if the parameter sigma changes, it can happen that you maybe have a high volatility here, and maybe you have a low volatility here in at the bottom, yeah, where paths move a bit a little bit yeah, um, slower. Okay, so that is the concept of a local volatility. In contrast, the implied volatility is, well, I derive it from observing the option value. And the option value is the expectation of maximum of S of capital T. So this is like a quantile or a variance, a property of the terminal distribution of S of capital T. Yeah. So it is maybe related to how does the distribution at capital T look like? Okay, so it is maybe a property related to distrib distribution. I use the maximum of S of T and minus K and zero function to cut off a certain part from this distribution, calculate the value, calculate the implied volatility. Okay, so one is the local, a local property property, the other is more telling us something about the terminal distribution. Nevertheless, you can look at the implied volatility for different times, right? I can look at this for different times and also for different strikes. Okay, so here's the strike and here's maybe the payoff. You can look at different strike. So it is a continuum parameterized by time, maturity, and strike, strike, which is related to S. And this guy here is also such a continuum parameterized by simulation time and by the state S. So there is a natural question. Uh, can I find a local volatility model if I observe an implied volatility surface. So I will come to this and it's the, the peer formula. So now assume that I observe values of call options that have a certain maturity and a strike K. So I have the payoff maximum of S of T minus K and zero paid in capital T. So if I multiply this with the numeraire of little t, uh, say zero, and divide by the numeraire at capital T. And now I take the expectation of that. This gives me now the value of my call option for a given maturity and um, a given given strike K. 
So I assume I can observe such a continuum of option prices. If, it, if you don't have a continuum, then maybe you have to do some interpolation or whatever. So now I observe the values, but you can immediately convert them to implied volatilities or back. Yeah? So that's more or less the space of values or implied volatilities. Okay, so I assume that I have this function. Now, assuming a local volatility model, so ds is rsdt plus sigma log dw. Then if this continuum of prices is arbitrage free, okay, so there is a small but important condition, yeah. If it is violated, you can still plug it into the formula and you get interesting, interesting um, results. So you can you can actually check if it is arbitrage free. Then you can calculate the local volatility from these option values. And the formula is that is the square root of two times differentiate with respect to maturity plus r times k differentiate with respect to strike divided by second derivative with respect to strike. Okay, and if you now use this local volatility in this model and value the options with this model, it will reproduce all these option prices. So this model will reproduce all the option prices C of TK. Okay, so that's, that's a nice thing. Um, two small remarks. You observe here the second derivative of the call price with respect to the strike. We had this before. Another nice theorem is that the second derivative of the value with respect to the strike is the probability density, yeah? modulo uh, some multiplication here with, with the numerator. So this is the probability density. So this guy below here is somewhat related to the probability density. So free of arbitrage means that the probability density is positive. And indeed, in order to get the square root here, this stuff here has to be positive. And this is what now absence of arbitrage means. This whole thing here needs to be positive. And there are two relations. This guy is positive because it is the probability density. And then this part here also has to be positive, which is a relation between the different times and which is sometimes called the calendar arbitrage constraint. Yeah? The calendar because it is a relation between different times. So this is a relation between different strikes it has to be a convex function, density is positive, and this is the relation between different times. Okay, and if this thing is positive, it means I have absence of arbitrage and I can calculate this local volatility. Of course, here I have the model in say some uh, normal formulation. You could also switch to a log normal model where, where this part here is having an additional parameter S, yeah, log normal. Yeah, okay, then the local volatility is just the one with this parameter S, yeah, and if you then divide by this, you get a one divided by K, because if you go back here, um, this K here is this parameter, which is then replaced with the S. Okay, so that's the the peer formula to determine the local volatility of a model that reproduces all these option prices. Yeah, maybe it's a nice exercise to start with Black-Scholes formula and calculate all these quantities here with Black-Scholes formula, and then check that the result is truly sigma times s. Okay, that's maybe a nice, nice little exercise. Um, I don't have a proof of this formula here, but we can very quickly see why this relation 
looks like it looks because we already saw the Feynman cuts formula. And if you remember that, So that one is here, yeah? So Feynman cuts. I have European option prices. So European option prices are of this form. They are a conditional expectation of the future values, okay? So I'm more or less in this setup here. Yeah? And Feynman cuts tells me that then these prices fulfill this PDE here. Later in the proof of the weak convergence of the Euler scheme, we had this a little bit nicer. Yeah? So here is the U yeah? and here is the Feynman cuts. So maybe I copied this on the other slide. So it was a DU by DT plus mu du by dx plus one half sigma squared, second derivative of u with respect to x equals zero. Okay, and in the Feynman cuts, the x is actually the s. But if X is the S, differentiating with respect to S is like minus differentiating with respect to K. So this means that the DU by DX corresponds to a minus DU by DK. So this is just now heuristic, yeah? So it just corresponds to that. Um, and second derivative with respect to X corresponds to just second derivative with respect to K. And then in the Feynman cuts, the S is the simulation time. And well, I had a final condition. Here, this is maturity. So differentiating with respect to little t is like minus differentiating with respect to capital T, yeah? because the time runs in the opposite direction. So I have that du by d little t corresponds to du by d capital T. So this means if you take these things here into account. So sorry, there's a minus, yeah? A minus here. Mm. Maybe I make this nice. If you take these into account, it means that there will be a minus here in front and a minus here in front. So now move this to the other side multiply with two, divide by the second derivative, and you have solved this equation for sigma squared. Take the square root and you are done. Okay, so you see that this heavily relates here to what we already saw in Feynman cuts. I just solve for the coefficient sigma. That appear formula, very nice. I can even further generalize the model to have a stochastic volatility. And the example I would like to present and then further investigate is the Heston model. So instead of now having a local volatility, so that was here, I now have an additional stochastic process. There is the square root of V here. And this stochastic process has an independent stochastic driver. So there is a DW2 here, yeah, possibly independent, which drives this stochastic process V.
Okay, so that's not a local volatility because I have an additional stochastic process that has to be specified. Yeah, to some extent, um, if you see it as an ETO stochastic process and you see this here is a vector, an SV, a vector, then of course you just have here in front a function of this vector. Okay, but it is not that it is a local volatility model in one dimension. No? The other one was in one dimension where this function here just depended on S. So now this uh, model is yeah, an even you know, further generalization. Yeah? It deviates from the local volatility model. And an interesting question, which I do not discuss here, but you know that this is uh, a nice project exercise is, if you now calculate the option prices from that, you could calculate an equivalent local volatility that generates the same option prices. And what's then the difference between these two models? Okay, so there is a difference, but the difference is not observable in the terminal distributions. So the difference somewhere lies in the transition probabilities that are different in the forward volatility. Yeah. Okay, so that is the Heston model. Uh, my volatility parameter is driven by an independent uh, ETO process. So I have in addition, a correlation parameter, so dw1, dw2 is rho dt. Yeah, um, the v is the sigma squared. Yeah, so you see this here is the square root of v. So the v is somewhat the sigma squared. Assume, for example, that kappa is zero and xi is zero. Then it means that dv is zero. So it means that V is constant. So it means that V is just its initial value. It's just the sigma square. And you have here a square root of this sigma square, which means if kappa and xi are zero, this is just the black schultz model. Okay, so this is nice. Yeah, I always like it if a model unfolds from something from a point that we already know, yeah? because then we can study a little bit better the behavior. So maybe we can independently study the behavior of this guy here and also maybe in another session of this guy here and also of the whole. Yeah, so it is a black scholz model, which has maybe three additional parameter. Yeah? If that initial value is, is considered as the black scholz the associated value, then it now has three or four additional parameters. There's the volatility of volatility. Then there are the kappa and the theta that somehow model a mean reversion feature. And there is this correlation rho, uh, which is uh, creating some kind of leverage. Uh, when one guy is moving up, the other guy should also move up. Uh, correlation uh, or anti-correlation. You can ask, of course, is V positive? Because I'm taking here the square root of V. So it, the process should remain positive. And if the parameters fulfill the condition two kappa times theta is larger than, uh, larger than C squared, then the process V is strictly positive. This is called the Feller condition. However, if we implement this in a computer, it may happen that due to the Euler scheme, yeah, so I have here some coefficient times a normal distributed random variable, due to the Euler scheme, it may happen that the V becomes negative. So we have to build in something that makes the Euler scheme yeah, cope with this. And this is sometimes called a truncation scheme. <coughs> So this is the Heston model. We have the black scholz like parameters, the initial value, the interest rate, the initial value of the volatility process. And we have the 
additional Heston parameter, the volatility of volatility, the mean reversion speed and the mean reversion level and the correlation parameter. Okay, and as I already mentioned, if we have the situation that C and kappa are zero, the model is identical to a Black-Scholes model with a constant volatility parameter um, sigma. If just C is zero, yeah, then you see what you have here is that the stochastic part goes away. So you ha just have a time dependent volatility on in, in your Black-Scholes model. So it is a Black-Scholes model with a time dependent uh, volatility. Okay, and I also mentioned that a truncation scheme, when we define an Euler scheme, I need to ensure that the volatility or the V remains positive. The V is then the variance remains positive, at least under the square roots. Okay, so at least here you should do something. And there are different techniques. Yeah, you can just cut it off. This is then called a truncation scheme. Somehow the point zero is then becoming an absorbing point. Or you can just reflect the simulation path by taking absolute value. Yeah, so if it jumps to minus 0.3, you reflect it to 0.3. So these are then different um, uh, possibilities to ensure that this is remaining positive. And actually, if you then implement this uh, as an Euler scheme, using these, um, yeah, securing belts, yeah, that ensure that the V is positive, you can even simulate the model when the model is violating the Feller condition and you get some, some, some results. Actually, in my example, in the end, when we study the model, I have a parameter configuration that is actually violating this condition, but it's not so important yeah? because I like to study the parameter C and not the other parameters. So now we have a stochastic um, volatility model. And what I like to do with you is to now use the stochastic volatility model. And the nice thing is that this model, if kappa is zero, okay, then if C is zero, the model corresponds to a Black Schultz model. So in the implied volatility smile, I see a horizontal line. If I value European option with that model, I see a horizontal line. Then I would like to investigate what happens if we increase this parameter C, the volatility of volatility. And in order to study this, uh, another nice property is helpful. And that property is the quadratic variation. Okay, so let's take a step back and I have a nice motivation for this. If you perform risk neutral valuation of some future payoff, for example, here, the payoff of a call option, yeah? Maximum of S minus K and zero. So risk neutral valuation is you move to the equivalent martingale measure. So S divided by N, N is chosen as a numeraire, S divided by N should be a martingale. So you know how this process looks under the equivalent martingale measure. Yeah. So you have the equivalent martingale measure and you take the expectation with respect to that equivalent martingale measure. This is risk neutral valuation. Now, actually, what is this? Risk neutral evaluation relies on the fact that we can set up a replication portfolio. So behind all this, maybe you remember this, is that we have a replication portfolio that I can set up 
and that I can rearrange in a self-financing way that is always accruing, well, apart from maybe some hatching errors, but in theory, is always accruing with this derivative value. So actually I can ensure that the P, the replication portfolio is equal to the V in a self-financing way by just rearranging the portfolio. And if I have this, and if it's self-financing, it means I do not need to add anything on the way to the final time, capital T, then the cost to set this portfolio is the value of the financial derivative. So risk neutral valuation is the cost to set up and maintain, yeah? but there is nothing in between because it is self-financing. It is the cost to set up the replication portfolio. The replication portfolio is a linear combination of financial products. In our case, for example, if I look here at the Delta hedge, it's just a combination of the stock and the numeraire. So I have two ingredients. So I have S and N. So that means my replication portfolio P is actually something like phi zero times N. How many units of the numeraire do I have? Plus phi one times S, how many units of S do I have? And the units of S are easily to obtain. The units of S, so here this phi one, is the first derivative of the valuation function, so of the Black-Schultz function, if it is a Black-Schultz model, with respect to S. So how does the value change if S changes? So what is the slope of the valuation curve. So if my valuation curve is here, this red curve, okay, then if you are here in this point, your replication portfolio is just this linear function. So this here is my replication portfolio P, which is just a linear function in S. And now performing this hatching is like balancing with a stick on a rope, okay? So whenever this value here moves up to some other point, you rearrange your replication portfolio to attach again to the curve with the right slope, such that if you have movements in this small region here, the two move in the same way. So you see, if you are here in an infinitesimal small region, there's no difference between the replication portfolio and your financial derivative. And if you move up, you are slowly rearranging the replication portfolio. Okay, so that is the delta hedge, which consists of holding that many units of the stock and self-financing then tells you how much units you have to use from the numeraire. Okay, that is now how the trader is doing the hatching. So there is a small issue. For a call option, for example, this function, how does the value of the option depends on the currently observed underlying stock value, S, you know, is convex. So you know this here is maybe just Black Schultz formula for a payoff that pays maximum of S minus K. And this is a convex function. And the trader cannot adjust this portfolio in infinitesimal time steps, in infinitesimal value steps. So he will make this in discrete steps. And if you then look at this picture in discrete steps, you see that he is continuously making losses. So the trader is making continuously 
small losses. For example, if the stock moves from this point to say, for example, that point, which is now S of T plus a small change in the stock value, then we see that here, the replication portfolio and the derivative value deviate. So there's this region here, which is a loss. And of course, the losses depend on how volatile is my stochastic process. So how fast am I moving here in between these values? And how convex is this function? Because you see that here in this region, the function is maybe not so convex. So the losses are maybe smaller in this region. Okay, so that's hedging and I have maybe a separate lecture on hedging, but now you have some intuition what the trader is doing and that his strategy is generating small losses. Also note that if, you, if the trader is moving here and you now attach the new replication portfolio here. So this here is the new replication portfolio. You see the slope is increasing. So this means that whenever the stock moves up, he has to increase the slope. He has to buy more units of S. So this is a strange strategy. When the stock moves up, you buy more, but when the stock moves down, you, you sell. Yeah? So buy high, sell low is a strategy that loses maybe money on the way. So what this trader sees on this thing on, on, on a single path. Yeah? So now a trader is walking on a single path of our stochastic process. So he's, he is walking here on a single path of the stochastic process. So maybe this here is my stochastic process having different simulation path. There's the option payoff here at the final time. And he is walking along a single path and then he has to pay something. And he's continuously adjusting his portfolio. And what he sees on the single path is that when the stock has moved by a delta S, okay, let's take Taylor expansion. That is the previous value he has in his portfolio plus how the portfolio is adjusting. So this part here is actually corresponding to what his replication portfolio does. So this corresponds to the replication portfolio at the previous time, plus the derivative of the replication portfolio because the derivative of the replication portfolio was, was set to be dv by ds times the delta s. Okay, so this here is covered by his replication, but this part here is not covered by his replication. So one half second derivative of v with respect to s times delta s squared. Yeah, so when, when s moves, I have a delta s, the delta S squared gives me um, some kind of, say, friction. So I have some kind of friction. You can also look at this in, say, continuous time, which is maybe a bit nicer because then I do not have these higher order terms. So even if you make this in infinitesimal time steps, because we have stochastic processes, the trader is making these frictions, these losses. Yeah, so even if we do it in infinitesimal time steps, I have that 
we have a term one half second derivative of V with respect to S, ds ds. No? So this is just um, Ito's lemma. Uh, okay. So there is this friction and I'm making this over the whole path here. So this means I'm making this from zero to T. So I can maybe just integrate this part here. And you see, this is the accumulated losses we make on the, on the path to the final time. So actually these losses are covered because they are covered by the option value. So this is why the option has a value that increases if volatility increases. So if volatility increases, the option price, the option value is higher because I have to cover these frictions. And you see in this friction, there is the sigma parameter. Yeah? ds ds is sigma squared dt, dt. The term we observe here is sensitive to two parts. The first part is the convexity of the value function. As I explained, how convex is the function? Because if it's linear, a linear replication portfolio is perfect. And the second part is this integral ds ds, the quadratic variation, how volatile is ds? Okay, so integral ds ds is the quadratic variation. So actually integrate from zero to t and it is a random variable. So it is a stochastic process, the quadratic variation process. So I denote this here by S, S of T, it's the integral from zero to T, DS, DS. If you like to have a nice intuition, you can numerically approximate the quadratic variation. Assume you have say an Euler scheme. So I have some time discrete approximation of S or you, you know S of TI, you have the um, explicit uh, solution. Yeah, Then you approximate the DS by a Delta S a delta s of ti, and you see that this is just the delta s of ti squared, which I'm integrating here, which I'm just summing up. Okay, so this quantity is the variation we accumulate on a single omega. Yeah, this is a random variable. Yeah, and if I plug, so this is a stochastic process. And if I plug in the capital T, it's a random variable. So this is the variation we accumulate walking on this path omega up to the final time. So this is like we had time average and space average. Yeah. Uh, we could look at the time variance. This is maybe now the time variance and the space variance. And the quadratic variation is really now um, helpful in understanding why our stochastic volatility model is creating the volatility smile. Few examples. So if S follows the Black Scholz model, then DS, DS is just sigma squared S squared, well, DW, DW, DT. If I take logarithm of S, yeah? you use Ito's lemma, you see D log S is in the Black Scholz model, sigma L DW, the quadratic variation of the log S process, integrated divided by capital T is then just the sigma L squared for the Bachelier model, ds ds is 
sigma n squared dw, dw is a dt, integrating the dt gives a capital T, dividing by the capital T gives me the sigma n squared. So you can extract the model parameters from also the quadratic variation. Okay, so and now I have a nice experiment. I would like to use Heston model. Okay, where we use the Black Schultz like parameters, initial value is one, R is 5%, sigma is 30%. And the theta is actually not important because I will set kappa to zero, also rho to zero. So Feller condition is actually not fulfilled here, but that's not so important. And then I choose the C to be either zero or 15%. If it is zero, this is a Black Schultz model. So for C equal zero, this model corresponds to Black Schultz model. If C is 15%, I have a volatility of volatility and I would like to study what, what is happening. So I will study different objects and let's, let's maybe start and look at some code. As always, you find the code here in our uh, repository in this package and it's that, that class. Okay. So it's this class here. And okay, so maybe we can look a little bit at the parameters. Initial value are 5%, volatility 30%, like I wrote. The theta is just sigma squared, but the theta is not important because my kappa is zero. The rho is also zero and the C will be varied. Yeah, so I have here a, for, um, a constructor that takes the C and I construct this now either with C equal zero or with C equal 15%. And then I call the method analyze. Um, if I look at the financial product, the option maturity is five, five years. So my final time horizon is in T equals five. Yeah, let's look at what we analyze. So this is here my function analyze. And now the thing is nice. We can use our laboratory and study all the stuff. So let's create a time discretization. Number of time steps is quite high, 500 time steps. So I have a very fine simulation st stepping. Uh, this I'm just doing because I would like to have an accurate quadratic variation. Yeah, Quadratic variation is the time steps, yeah? time steps, the changes over one time step squared and then summed up. Okay, so I have a very fine time stepping. I have a Brownian motion, my Brownian motion has two factors because it is a Heston model, DW1, DW2. Um, the Heston model is already specified here. Okay, so I can just use it. We have, we have a Heston model with these parameters. We do an Euler scheme discretization and we pack everything in this wrapper together. So now I can get a few quantities. So for example, this here is the S of capital T, yeah, this T equals five years. Then I can also get the simulation path, the stochastic process. So this here is the map T, T maps to S of little t. I can have a look at these guys. How do they look like? And I also calculate the quadratic variation. So what you see here is I do an integer stream uh, from zero to N minus one. Uh, if I have um, N minus one time steps, uh, so it, it goes from T zero to T N. Uh, so, but here I use number of time steps. So that goes to N minus one. So I can have a last step in the end. So, and then this map is 
for time step E, I take the difference of S at time Ti plus one and S at time Ti. And then here my suggestion was, let's look at the quadratic variation of the logarithm. Yeah? So we look at D log S, D log S. So why is that? Because my model for C equals zero is a Black Schultz model. So I'm expecting that the quantity which I calculate is just the parameter sigma squared from the Black Schultz model. So this is nice. My expectation is that if this Heston model is consistent with the Black Schultz model, this quadratic variation is exactly the sigma L squared, well, sigma L squared times capital T, but I divide here with the capital T. Okay, so I'm taking here the log of S. Yeah? So this here is the log of S T I plus one. Okay, and this here is the log of S T I. I take the difference of the two squared and then I divide by the capital T. So my expectation is to get the sigma superscript L squared. So my expectation is actually to get 0 0.3 squared is a 0 0.09. So the quadratic variation of a Black Schultz model with this formula here is a 0 0.09. Okay, so that's all. Yeah? So I'm just creating these three quantities, the S at the final time, the S at all times, and the quadratic variation. Let's make a first analysis and plot the implied volatilities. So this function is here. Uh, maybe, where is it? Here. So this function is here. So what I do is, for I define the function volatility smile for a given strike, I value a European option with that strike. So you see, this is just my Monte Carlo evaluation. Uh, this is maybe performing many evaluations. And then I just use the implied Black Scholes volatility formula. So this is just the inversion of the Black Scholes formula to calculate the implied volatility. And then I plot this. I make actually here two plots. One plot is where the axis is the strike and the other plot is where the axis is the logarithm of the strike because then it's a little bit more symmetric. So let's create this plot. Okay, so what we see is left for the Black Scholz model, there's no dependency of the implied volatility on the strike. This is a Monte Carlo simulation, but if I calculate the implied volatility, I get the 0 0.3. Right, with the Xi being 15%, we see a kind of bending. The implied volatility is moving up at the end, and indeed it's moving down in the middle here at one. Now you see that this point here is below. If you take not the strike, but the logarithm, you see that this is also somewhat symmetric. Yeah, So it's a little bit above here, okay, because also interest rate is not zero. So we have this picture here where I plot the implied Black Scholz volatility here for the Black Scholz model and here for the Heston model with a certain Xi, with a certain stochastic volatility. And if you plot it against the logarithm here for Heston and here for Black Scholes, then you see that we have some kind of bending. Yeah? So these points here are pulled down. These points here are pulled up a little bit. So 
volatility of volatility is creating volatility smile. And if implied volatility is just another parameter for the value of the option, and an option becomes more expensive if volatility increases, it means that these guys become cheaper and these guys become more expensive. Okay, so options outside, so as one says, far out of the money, become more expensive. Why is this happening? Can we understand this? Well, we had this nice little theorem that told us how we can find the probability density that is associated with S. Yeah? So we see the underlying S of T. So I have another plot that plots the probability density for these two configurations. Okay, so here are the two probability densities up Black Schultz model below the Heston model. So what am I doing? Let's have a look at this function here. How do I plot the probability density? So there is here just a function that tells me create density. And what I'm doing is I plot the density of the logarithm of S. This means here, ah, maybe I should improve that. On this axis, you have the logarithm of that. That's a typo. Okay. So here on the axis, I have the logarithm of S. Yeah. So S equals one. My initial value is here the zero. Yeah? So logarithm of one is zero. So somewhat it is centered around the initial value. Um, well, there is some interest rate drift, yeah, but that maybe doesn't matter. What is the parameter volatility of volatility? So the in introduction of stochastic volatility doing. So you see that here, this part becomes higher. Huh? So here I'm at 0 0.6, here I'm at 0 0.7. And how is it coming higher? Because actually this part here are pushed down. If you look here at what's happening at minus one, it goes to 0 0.2, but here minus one is below 0 0.2, right? It's a, push, a little bit pushed down. Okay, so these are my density plots. This is log of S of T. Okay, and you see that the density is pushed up here. And it's pushed a little bit down here. All right, if you look, it's pushed down here. And it's also pushed down here, right? Okay, so why is this happening? Yeah. So the implied volatility was going up on the sides and was going down in the middle. So somehow it looks as if the density is becoming larger where volatility is becoming smaller. But that's maybe not a good thing to do, look at because we are looking at implied volatility and the density. Maybe we can understand this even better. But from these two pictures or from these two experiments, uh, we already see that when volatility becomes smaller, the density appears to become higher and vice, vice versa. So it is a little bit that where volatility is high, the process doesn't like to stay. Okay, and actually that makes sense because if volatility is high, it the process will move very quickly and he will move much faster away. Yeah? So volatility means 
stronger movement. And stronger movement means I leave this area much faster. Ah, okay, so maybe we have understand something. Yeah? When volatility is high, density is low because the process does not like to be where volatility is high. So how does, for example, the quadratic variation look at the different, um, yeah, at the final time? So what I can also do is I can also plot, sorry, I can also plot the density of the quadratic variation. So this is just the same similar function, which is now plotting the density, but of the quadratic variation of the random variable quadratic variation at the final time. Let's run this. Okay, so top is the Black scholz model. And you would expect that the quadratic variation is a constant because in Black scholz model, it is a constant. And that constant is, as we have predicted, 0 0.09. Yeah, the square of 0 0.3. But I observed that there is some deviation from this constant. This is because this is a numerical simulation. Yeah? There is some noise coming from the Monte Carlo simulation. But actually within plus minus one, I'm actually around this constant value of the quadratic variation. If I use now the Heston model, you see that the quadratic variation is really a distribution. So there are sample paths that have a high quadratic variation. You see, it goes up to three times the quadratic variation here. And there are sample paths that have a very low quadratic variation. So I can also plot the density of the Black-Scholes quadratic variation which somewhat stays here in the corridor between 0.08 and 0.1. So around the analytic quadratic variation of 0.9, uh, 0 0.09. Yeah? So this is my sigma L squared. But for the Heston model, I get that now the quadratic variation is a distribution, okay? Because now I have here that my C parameter is 15% and the quadratic variation is a distribution. So there are different sample paths that along the line have different quadratic variation. And now comes the best picture. Let's look at the sample path. And in this function, I make a nice little thing. I, I pass also the quadratic variation here and I use the quadratic variation to define the color of the path. So sample paths that have low quadratic variation will be green. Sample paths that have medium quadratic variation will be blue and sample paths that have high quadratic variation will be red. Uh, so, and in between it's a linear interpolation. So I use this color here to set the color of this sample path. Okay, and if I run this, the first picture corresponds to the Black Schultz model. where all the sample paths have similar, yeah, small deviations, quadratic variation. And this is the Heston model with the volatility of volatility, the stochastic volatility. And now we understand what is happening, why the Heston model is introducing this volatility smile. All sample paths have the same 
quadratic variation in the Black Scholes model. But in the Hessel model, I have different sample paths that have different quadratic variations. And the effect that is happening is that a sample path that has a high quadratic variation has a higher probability to move away from the initial value. So that's the reason why we observe high quadratic variations further away. A medium quadratic variation, a blue one, also drives maybe the process away from the initial value, but it is not such high that yeah, it's less likely to be far away. Of course, such a such a simulation path also can return back to the center. Yeah? But it's just that the probability to observe something far away is higher if the quadratic variation is high. Okay, so that is here a medium quadratic variation. And a low quadratic variation means that the stochastic process is not moving strongly. It stays close to where it started. So the thing is that a high quadratic variation increases the probability that I will be far outside. And now I can flip this. At far outside points, I observe sample paths that have a higher quadratic variation. So now if I flip this, it is that if I'm close to the initial value, I observe more sample paths that have small quadratic variation. And if I'm far out from the initial value, I observe more sample paths that have high quadratic variation. So this model has the effect that the quadratic variation is small in the middle and large on the outside. And this is why the price is moving down in the middle and moving up on the outside. And now you have that options that have a strike that is on the outside. They have larger convexity on the outside. So the convexity is larger on the outside if the option has the strike on the outside. And that's now why I also observed this on the implied volatility smile, which is looking at options of different strike. Huh? An, option, an option with strike K is investigating yeah, or measuring the quadratic variation in this region. I have a last plot and then we are done. So my last plot is now, let's create a scatter where I plot the stock on the x-axis and the quadratic variation on the y-axis. So which stock value comes together with which quadratic variation? So if you, are, if you run this, you get this plot. So this means for the black shorts model, and for the Heston model, the connection or the relation between final value of the stock and which quadratic variation that I had on the way to that value is different. Actually for the black model, there should be no difference of the quadratic variation at all. The quadratic variation should be 0.09. I have small deviations because this is a numerical method. But for the Heston model, you observe that there are many different quadratic variations possible, but there is some kind of boundary here. No, or maybe like that, which is that far out values can only be reached if the quadratic variation is high enough. Okay, and that's now the reason why we get this shape. Yeah, summary, where volatility is high, density is low, 
the stochastic process does not like to stay in areas where volatility is high. Yeah? It will move away. If the quadratic variation is larger on a sample path omega, it's more likely that this sample path reaches outside points. It's more likely that it lies further away from the expected value. So this means the quadratic variation in average is, re is larger in regions where the final realization is far away. And the convexity of the European option is larger if we get closer to the strike. So far out options are set more sensitive to quadratic variation on the far out points. Uh, options that are far out of the money become more expensive if the quadratic variation increases. And together, all these guys now give us a nice insight why we observe this in blood volatility smile. That was it for today. Okay, sorry for the overtime, but I believe it's maybe helpful for the project to have all this together. Thanks. <laughs>